thank you so much. Um, I was really actually very honored to be asked to speak at TED um, for many reasons, um, one of which is that I don't really actually think I deserve to be here. Um, I had so many opportunities in my life for education, um, for travel, and I took those things for granted. Um, and I feel like every opportunity I've had in my life came um, not because of my own doing. And I, and I wonder, you know, what if, what if we could provide the opportunities that I had in my life to every child, to the children that are more motivated and more driven than I ever was? Um, and I want to look at what that might mean for the future. Um, you know, we know the numbers. There's 2 billion young people in the world. There's 1.2 billion living in poverty. There are 130 million young people that have absolutely no access to any education at all. And another 600 million that have an education that's completely inadequate. So um, the question is, you know, when I, when I tell this story in London, this is sort of when people start playing with their Blackberries and they go, yeah, yeah, I've heard this before. Well, you know, these are real people. They aren't just numbers. We get overwhelmed by these depressing statistics that demand impossible change, but these are real people. And these are young people who struggle and innovate and are such amazing entrepreneurs, even under the most difficult circumstances. So what I wanted to look at is, is what if, what if all had in my life for a good education could be provided to these truly driven young people. Um, and I'm, I'm the managing director of a social enterprise based in London. And what we're trying to do is take um, all of the capacity and innovation of a leading European social learning organization and try and deliver that for um, a better quality education in developing countries. So we started with um, a program to um, deliver IT learning for teachers and students. Um, the reason being, we really felt that IT is a key enabler in learning any subject. Um, and the goal was always to deliver that same high quality learning in all subjects. Um, we, we met with governments across um, Africa and teachers and, and the uh, feedback was always the same. This is really great, we love what you've done, but we need this in every subject. We need this for maths, we need it for science, we need it for English, and we need it to be mobile. We need this to be available on mobile devices and we need it to be available in the villages. Um, you know, that was a pretty big challenge for us and we thought, okay, you know, we thought we'd done pretty good here, so now, now how are we going to actually expand this so hugely? It wasn't until this year that the corporate side of our business actually came up with a new content production mechanism and a social learning platform that's now finally going to allow us to deliver the same quality of learning across all subjects for primary and secondary in what we think is one of the most innovative learning environments ever built. So that's what I wanted to look at today um, is our virtual school. Um, you know, I think we, we know the impact of the great schools. You look at Eton in the UK, um, that's graduated almost every UK prime minister. You look at Starehe in Kenya, that graduates a third of all Kenya's medical students. What we need to do is exponentially increase the reach of these elite teachers, because we know that effective education can change lives. And the way to do that is to start to use technology better to improve education more. We've seen that the technology is there. What we haven't done is applied that for the education sector in the way that we think it can be applied. Um, you know, one of the things um, that we need to think about is actually reversing the Victorian age education system. The world has changed a lot in the last 140 years, but schools, they look exactly the same. Like I'm going to show now. <laughs> you know, it's the same structure, it's the same models. In this picture, it looks like it's the same desks. But if you look at the modern workplace, it looks nothing like the workplace of the 1900s. So that's a serious and important disconnect because what it means is that we're not preparing young people for the 21st century. I think um, in spite of the education institutions, learning is changing. It's being changed by the masses because learners are choosing to learn in a new way. We've seen that, we've seen social networking, we've seen the rise of YouTube. So I think. The thing is, technology has and, conti and will continue to fundamentally change the way that we learn. And that's being driven in part by the massive increase in access to mobile phones. So there's 5.3 billion mobile phones in the world today. But the amazing thing is that 3.8 billion of those are in developing countries. So that, that growth is being led by developing countries and that, that provides a huge opportunity. On top of that, you look at the rise of the internet, 3G, 4G, it's reaching sort of the, the corners of the world that we, we didn't think it would before. And with that means that there's more information available than ever before. 
So you couple that with mobile technology and it's actually changing the way that students are learning. It's no longer about holding every piece of information in your brain anymore. It's actually about building the skills that you need to access information when you need it. It's about learning what Googling means and YouTubing. It's, it's a whole new world and we have to start to take that into consideration when we're building education programs. So, so what does that mean for education? Well, I think we need to go back to sort of that first question, Oops. which is, you know, what if? What if we could exponentially increase the reach of the world's best teachers and provide the same quality of education that I got to every single student? What would that mean for the poorest kids in the world? What would it mean for their families, for their children, and even for their country? I think that's what we're trying to find out. And in 10 days, we're actually launching the first ever pilot of our virtual school. We'll just show you what that is. That's going to be right here in South Africa, in the Western Cape. So what we're doing is we're providing locally generated video-based content through an accessible online learning program. Students can access this information for free from their mobile phone, from a computer, and hopefully, you know, eventually even from the most basic mobile phones. So this just explains a little bit what that means. The virtual school will deliver world-class education free of charge to the poorest children at the bottom of the pyramid. Children who live on less than a dollar a day. Our goal is to take the best education and improve it using everything we've learned from designing innovative solutions for our global 500 clients. We want to provide the highest quality education for the six core subjects, including maths, English, physics, biology, chemistry and IT. You know, our first program as a social enterprise was to build a comprehensive IT program to help teachers and students learn and teach more effectively. Um, but what we recognized, it, it was, I mean, it was one of the first programs ever built of that kind specifically for Africa. But what we realized was it's such a diverse continent. We were going to have to find a way to produce this content in a way that could easily be localized and translated. And what that meant was that we had this huge challenge of trying to build the highest quality content possible at the lowest possible cost. And that meant we had to completely rethink the whole way e-learning content is built. And the, the, the solutions that we came up with for programs in Africa have actually completely changed the way that we run our enterprise in Europe as well. So we knew, um, you know, we knew the challenges of the current e-learning course. And one of them is cost. So in the, the way that a traditional e-learning course is built, you know, it takes six months and about 10,000 pounds just to build one hour of e-learning content. So that was going to be completely unaffordable for our social enterprise, and especially to look at the number of courses we were looking at building. So the second is time. The old production model involves a subject matter expert, and, and you saw um, Tian's presentation earlier. Well, it's the same thing. You have an instructional designer, you have someone writing a script, you have a, a director, you have all of these different things. And that meant that it wouldn't be scalable to try and localize that and translate it across a number of countries. The third is accessibility. We've already learned about you know, the, the, the increase in access to information. So e-learning courses were built to provide a lot of information, but they weren't structured in a way that allows students to go back to the content when they need to revise or they need to access that piece of information and they can't remember quite where it was. Um, you know, Professor Miller was this professor in 1956 and he proved that we can only hold five to nine bits of information in our short-term memory. Professor Ebbinghaus, 100 years ago, proved that we forget half of what we learn in an hour and 80% in a month. So what that means is that we have to be able to access that content. We have to be able to use technology to help students remember better and access information when they need it. So what we did was we actually went back to first principles in a way. What is learning? Learning is Learning is accessing information from the expert. So we revised the production process, and now instead of six months and tens of thousands of pounds, we can build content in two steps and at a fraction of the cost of what was possible before. So what that means is that now, for the first time, we can actually consider building an entire curriculum for primary and secondary, putting it online and making it freely available, and localizing it across any number of countries and languages at a fraction of the cost. We think about 10% of the cost five times faster and we can make it a lot more effective. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we do is we capture the best explanation from the expert in any given subject. We then use our visual designers. They can use effective images and memory triggers to help students understand faster, remember for longer, and access the information more easily when they need it. So I think um, you know, having, having revolutionized that process, what it now means is how do we make that available so we can build higher quality education, but how do we actually allow the students access to that content? 
So that's where we are using our social learning platform that we built for the corporate side of the business, which is, I mean, it's sort of a, a YouTube, Facebook, um, Twitter mix. And the idea is that this is going to be the most accessible program ever, not only because it's online, but because students can access it from a mobile, from a tablet. We can even push it out to set top boxes in the classroom. So what that means is that any student that can get access just to a mobile phone can have access to a much higher quality education. And not only that, I mean, we, we designed this program really to try and reach the students in the remote areas. So we're not quite there yet, but we are working on a solution that means the mobile learning providers can provide this even to the most basic mobile phones. As long as it has basic features and a camera, we should be able to provide this within the next six months to that phone. So we're not even looking at smartphones. We're looking at pretty basic technology. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in ICT programs across Africa. Um, so I know pretty well the variable connection speeds, um, you know, especially in the more remote areas. So we have built in um, an offline player. So what that means is that a student can, um, they can sync the programs to their laptop, to their mobile phone, even to a memory stick. So that when they don't have access to the internet, they can still go through their learning and study. And when they do have access, they can, they can access all of the social features that we have, the games and the leaderboards and the discussion forums. Um, so that means that, that really, as long as a student can, can at some point get access to the internet to download the content, they can have access to a better education. The virtual school helps students learn the way they want to learn. They can follow a more structured course style, dip in and out as they browse different content, or try keyword search to find specific content. Adaptive testing quickly helps students see what they don't know, so they can focus their attention on filling the knowledge gaps. So I think, um, you know, one of the things we know from the corporate side of the business is that people have different learning styles. Some people like to go th through things step by step. Some people like to search for the information that they want when they want it. And some people have heard an explanation and they just can't quite remember it. So they want to go back to it at the point of need. So the platform was really designed for, for that. It's designed to, to meet all of the kind of six learner styles that they have. Um, on top of that, the program is actually intelligent enough to know which country a student is from what their grade level is, and, and going back on their previous results, what their competency levels are. So that means that students are actually able to access only the content that's relevant to them, and they won't be overwhelmed by the amount of content to come in the future. And instead, we keep them focused on the short-term goals. On top of that, we know that learning is fundamentally a social experience. And so you must be asking, how can a student possibly learn from this platform? Well, it's not the ideal. Obviously, the best situation is every single student has access to the best teacher, but we know that that's not the reality. We know that it's unaffordable and unsustainable. So what we're looking at is building in online features and social groups, which means that students can have some aspects of that social life within the school. So like we said with Facebook that allows people to feel connected, it's the same situation. There's discussion groups, there are forums, there's quizzes to, to kind of let students compete against each other. Um, and in addition to that, I think, you know, there's, there's a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring aspect. So what we're going to have is actually trophies and badges, which are going to allow students to earn points, and that those points are also going to be given for peer-to-peer -peer mentoring. So if a student is mentoring another student, if a student is, is building user-generated content and other students are liking that content, their points are going to get raised up, and they're actually going to be, you know, the, the maths expert in South Africa. So that's a pretty exciting thing for the students. I think actually one of the most unique features of the platform is this user-generated content, the ability to capture audio and video within the platform itself. And it's this that's going to allow us to translate and localize across countries. What it means is we work with teachers in a given country, and they could actually take a sort of master copy of content. They could say, okay, yes, this matches with the curriculum, but this example is irrelevant, or you know, I, I, we need to translate this into in Tanzania, for example, Swahili. So what they can do is they actually translate the basic PowerPoint file and the audio themselves, and they can upload it into the system, and we can have a fully localized version of the curriculum. We then work with them to map that curriculum to their individual country. Then when a student from Tanzania comes into the classroom, the online classroom, it recognizes their own curriculum. They can see their own curriculum in that structure, or they can, of course, just search for the information that they want. So we have the platform, and we have the ability to build content. So what we wanted to do is actually see if these great ideas that we had would work in practice. So we started with four pilots um, in UK, Tanzania, India, and South Africa um, in order to test if, if we could actually build and localize the content. So we've learned a lot of lessons from that. The key pilot was actually right here in South Africa with um, the Kanya pro project in the Western Cape. So what we did was we found the um, best teachers we could in maths. 
we got them to help us break down the subject one learning objective in grade seven maths into its core concepts. We then localized that. What we, what we learned in that process is that in the UK, in South Africa, or in Tanzania, or in India, maths is maths. So most of those core explanations were the same. In the case of the, the, the learning objective we were working on, integers are integers. What are integers? You use integers for counting. For example, you might count how many friends you've made at school. When you start school, you might not have any friends. Then you make one, two, and hopefully many more. But you can't have a number of friends between, say, three or four, as you can't have three and a bit friends. आपके या तीन या फिर चार दोस्त हो सकते हैं अतः इंटीजर्स पूर्ण संख्या होते हैं शून्य इंटीजर है सो दिस लोकलाइजेशन दिस टुक अ फ्यू आवर्स सो वी सेंट द फाइल ओवर टू अ टीचर लिविंग इन इंडिया शी ट्रांसलेटेड द टेक्स्ट and she translated the audio and she put it into our system and we then synced the two in our office. So that just shows how easily we can actually lo uh, localize the content. I think um, the other lesson we learned in building the pilot is that especially with a subject like maths, it's not just conceptual, it's very practical. So what we had to do was we worked with teachers and a digital pen. So this is a teacher in South Africa going through a worked example for students. So the tips and the tricks that a teacher has to go through and solve problems. So I think um, you know what, what's really interesting about this is again this is a piece of technology this teacher had never used before, and all she did was hit record and we we made a video, put it into the system on how to use the pen. She did it. She uploaded the files, and we then had those files to put the nice little colors on and draw students' attention to the right bit. So I think that's a pretty pretty exciting for us because it means that our idea on content development it, it's worked pretty well so far. Um, so what's next? Um, on October 10th, we are launching the pilot in the Western Cape. So this is the first pilot of the actual distribution of the content. So we've done some pilots on the actual development of the content. Now we're going to make this platform available to students across the Western Cape. And what we want to find out really is, you know, do students like learning this way? Does this make sense for them? What, what are the tools and the functions that they need? We built this program or the platform in the UK for companies. We made some basic modifications to make it more user friendly for students. What we need to know now is from the students. I mean, they're the experts. They're the ones we want to support and we want to motivate. So, so what is it that they need within this platform? We want them to tell us how they want to learn and then we're going to build that for them. So that's what the pilot is about. Um, within the pilot, we have a community for teachers. So they'll have access to our ICT content. We want them to tell us what kind of reports they need, what kind of mapping they need in order to integrate this within their classroom. And from the students, they have access to their maths. So they can search for a concept that their teacher explained in class that they didn't understand, or they can go through it step by step. I think the most important community is the feedback community. We want students and teachers to leave text, video, and audio feedback. Um, we have a pilot in the UK, so they can have cross-cultural communication. They can also go through which maths games they each play. They can tell us exactly what they like and don't like, which piece of content they like, and what they want us to build within the platform. So, I mean, what's next? Basically, we're going to learn the same lessons that we learned on content production from the platform delivery, and we're going to build a mass of content starting in November. So we hope by September 2012 to have a full virtual school across the six core subjects for secondary school and eventually work backwards from primary. I mean, we're dealing with big questions, though, so we're always looking for people to get engaged um, because I think that these are pretty big questions. So. I think, um, you know, in closing, I, I think this is going to be one of the coolest learning environments ever built. Um, I'm really excited that our social enterprise model lets us take something that was built for the biggest and richest companies and, and deliver it for education. Um, and, you know, I, I can't wait to see what the truly motivated students do with the same opportunities that I've had. Because we're talking about, about the future. Well, this is their future. And I don't believe that their future is inevitable. I think that the technology Applied for education can make a huge difference, and I'm really excited about seeing what this can do.